want to start out with a little quiz for the group. So here's the quiz. Which day of the week are there the most searches for hangover? All right. Sunday. How many people say Sunday? Monday. Tuesday. Well, I've got a few party animals out there I can see. Well, how do you find out? Of course, you go to Google. And in this case, you go to Google uh, Search Insights. And it's a little tool that we built that will allow you to look at query volume. In this case, I went and typed in the query hangover. I picked uh, the date. I picked the US. And if you look at the chart in the bottom, you can see a very, very regular series. Turns out it peaks every Sunday. And that great big spike in the middle there, that's January 1st. <laughs> and in fact, if you scroll down this page a little bit, you can see that, in fact, New York is a hangover capital of the US, <laughs> followed closely by Massachusetts and New Jersey. And up there in the Bible Belt, either they don't get hangovers or at least they don't complain about them. So, uh, and then down at the bottom, there's a little data about the uh, most popular searches and the rising searches in that area. Not only can you look at one series of do one query, you can compare queries. And in this next chart, what I'm doing is looking at hangover and vodka. And if you examine that series closely, you'll see that vodka searches peak every Saturday and hangover searches peak every Sunday. <laughs> and the big peak in the middle there is December 31st. <laughs> so it's a kind of cute little model. And there are many fun things in Search Insights that you can discover by playing around with this, uh, with this data. But what I want to do is something serious with it, we want to use the data to look at economic predictions. So just like vodka is a predictor, in fact, of uh, hangovers, or at least hangover queries, we can look to see whether uh, various kinds of Google queries are predictive of interesting economic statistics. And if you want to follow up on this, we have a few papers that are posted on the Google uh, research blog. So the basic idea is to take uh, some lagged variables of a series, maybe some other predictors, throw in Google Trends, and see how well you can predict some economic index. Now, what we're doing here is we're generally focused on very short-term prediction because the Google queries are generally, generally contemporaneous with the index that we're trying to predict. But it's still advantageous because the government data, the index da data, is generally released with something of a lag. So let's look at an example. What we propose doing is fit the best model you can using the series you're trying to predict, then throw in the Google variables, the query variables, as an additional predictor, and see how much your prediction improves. And in economic data, typically, you're very interested in the turning points. It's easy to predict a series that goes like this or a series that goes like this. It's catching the turning points that are of interest. Now, generally, the economic data is released on a monthly basis, sometimes a quarterly basis. The Google data, in fact, is real time, released on a daily basis or a weekly basis. We have to deal with this mixed frequency problem. It's an index. You look at a normalized query share. So what you're seeing there is not the absolute level of queries, but the level of queries on hangover relative to the total number of queries that were issued during those particular periods. Uh, you have to have at least 50 or so observations to show up in the series. That's a privacy protection issue. And finally, the Google data is sampled data. So it's going to be different a little bit from day to day. So all of these things come up when you try to look at this data. And I will encourage you, kids, you can try this at home. You don't need to ask your parents' permission. You can go uh, to Google, download the search data, and play around with it to your heart's content. So. First example is unemployment. Here's a picture of the initial claims to unemployment benefits. So in this chart, the gray bars are recessions. The black line are the initial claims. So when you become unemployed, you go down to the office, you file a claim for unemployment benefits. And then the red line is the unemployment rate. So you can see that the initial claims peaks at the end of every recession. So it's the single best indicator for the end of a recession. The red line, the unemployment rate, peaks about six months after the initial claims. So economists watch the initial claims number very, very closely. It's released every Thursday morning. 
I just looked at the release from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it is ticked down again, which is a very good sign uh, for the economy. So how do you do this? Well, one thing you might do is you might go to another Google tool called Google Correlate, and you can feed in the data series on the initial claims for unemployment benefit. In this case, I feed in the non-seasonally adjusted series, just the raw data, and it turns out the query that's most highly correlated with that series is sign up for unemployment. Not too surprising. So, in fact, there's a very strong correlation. If you look at this chart, one of these lines, I guess the blue line is the actual data, the initial claims for unemployment, and then the red line is the query uh, volume, again, normalized query volume for sign up for unemployment. So it's not too surprising that if you got laid off, the first thing you do is type in a query in Google. How do I sign up for unemployment? How do I get unemployment benefits? How long do they last? And so on. And that's basically what, uh, what drives this. So if we build a little model and just a baseline model where we try to predict initial claims this week from initial claims last week, we get a mean absolute error, a forecast error of forecasting one period ahead of about 3.2%. Uh, if we add in the filing for unemployment query, that uh, mean absolute error goes down to about 3.17. That's not too uh, great. But if you look at what you would actually do, namely estimate the model up until week T and then forecast T plus 1, so do what's called a rolling window forecast, you see that you get a baseline estimate of about a baseline mean absolute error of about 3.3%. But when you throw in that Google query on sign up for unemployment, the uh, mean absolute error goes down to 3.22%. And you will look during the recession, that is the period that's really of interest here, where you actually saw the economy uh, tanking and unemployment rate going up, you end up with about a 9.3% improvement by using that additional predictor. So the 9.3% is a pretty uh, good boost. And that's doing a one week ahead uh, prediction, one week before the data is released. And this is a little picture of what it looks like where I plotted the actual in black, and then the uh, green and red are the baseline and the uh, data that includes uh, filing for unemployment. And you do get roughly, as I said before, about a 9.3% uh, improvement. Another cute example is this uh, travel to Hong Kong, any kind of destination planning. If you're thinking about going to Hong Kong, you might very well to Google, go to Google and type in hotels in Hong Kong, things to do in Hong Kong, restaurants in Hong Kong, all sorts of things like that. Very conveniently, the Hong Kong Tourism Board releases uh, every month, they release the number of visitors they receive from different countries. If you go look at this Google uh, Search Insights data that I was describing, one of the vacation destinations that's tracked is Hong Kong. So if you just plot those two pieces of data together, the visitors to Hong Kong from the US, uh, Canada, Great Britain, Germany, and so on, and compare that to the queries <coughs> on Hong Kong, you can see there's some relationship between those two numbers. If you build a little model, in this case, you've got the Raw data, you look at a, a model, uh, the simplest model you get is a seasonal autoregressive model where you're looking at the visitors at time t, depending on the visitors last month and the visitors 12 months ago. And uh, I used the Google Trends data for the first two weeks of the month. So we're trying to look halfway through the month. We're trying to see what the total visitors will look like for that month. That's about six weeks ahead of the actual data release. And if you run that model, you get really quite a good agreement between the forecast of visitors to Hong Kong, roughly six weeks ahead of the data release, two weeks ahead of the end of the month, uh, as uh, predicted by the Google queries uh, for destination planning to Hong Kong. Okay, so it's a it's a nice technique for uh, that kind of problem. Now the challenge in this, there are three challenges that come up from a methodological point of view. One is, in the case I showed you, simple correlation worked pretty good. I just looked for queries that were correlated with sign up for unemployment. But in more complex cases, that breaks down. And you can use human judgment. You can say, well, this is probably related to that. But of course, that doesn't scale to the kind of queries that we like to look at. Three problems. 
you want to adjust for the common seasonality and trend. Lots of times you'll find two things that are highly correlated just because they have a common seasonality. For example, if you look for predictors of auto sales, you'll see baseball is a pretty good predictor because both auto sales and baseball peak in the summer. But it's a good predictor only because it has the same seasonality, not because there's really any uh, underlying uh, causality there. You also have this problem with fat regression. Namely, you have hundreds of millions of possible predictors, and you're trying to, t to predict a time series that might be 90 observations long, monthly data back to 2004. So you could get a good predictor just by chance alone. And finally, what you're typically interested in in this context is looking at the incremental predictability. How much better can you do with this additional predictor than you could do using the past values of the series itself? So you have to deal with all these issues. Obviously, I don't have time to go into that in great detail, but I'll kind of uh, skip to an uh, illustrative example. In the top chart, I've graphed the US retail sales. So this is from the government economic statistics. In the bottom chart, I've plotted the seasonally adjusted retail sales. And if you look up at the top chart, you can see the most obvious feature of that graph is it peaks every Christmas time, just as you'd think. The most obvious feature of the graph, graph below is that it dropped during the recession. So the question is, you've got a strong Christmas effect in the top, you've got a strong recession effect in the bottom, if you use a variable selection mechanism, we use something called spike and slab regression, but most uh, methods would give you the same thing. The best predictor of the retail sales non-seasonally adjusted turns out to be queries on apparel, and the best predictor for the uh, retail sales seasonally adjusted turns out to be queries on coupons and rebates. And if you go look at the data, you can see why. The top plot is the retail sales. The bottom plot are the queries on apparel. And the queries on apparel have the same seasonality as retail sales. So what it's really doing when you're trying to find predictors here, it's picking out something that has the most correlation with the most prominent feature of the time series. Whereas you look at the seasonally adjusted retail sales, which has this very strong recession effect, and plot that in the graph below, I have coupons. So those are the coupon and rebate queries. You can see the coupon and rebate queries go up pretty much at the same time the economy is going down. Just as you'd expect, people would be, have more price sensitive queries uh, when economic times uh, get hard. So typically for economics, you'd be more interested in the second chart than the first chart because everybody knows that retail sales peaks every Christmas. What's interesting is trying to affect, uh, look at those changes in the underlying economic variables. Here's uh, what happens if you go back to Google Correlate, the thing I used earlier. If you feed in the retail sales data, what you get out are all queries on malls. So I know you can't see that from uh, where you're sitting most likely, but they're all queries on malls scattered around the country. And again, that's really just the seasonality. Here's a final example from the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. You can see the big drop during the recession comes back up again, and then it drops towards the end of that chart. That turns out to be the budget debates in Congress last summer, which I think depressed everybody, including the UM, uh, people in the UN consumer, UM Consumer Sentiment Index. What happens if we try to get some predictors of that? Well, I went through a fairly involved process where we corrected for seasonality, things like that. Turns out the best predictor in terms of query categories for that, uh, for consumer confidence, ends up being retirement and pension queries, and that enters positively. So when the market is booming, when things are going great, people are looking at their 401ks and just uh, chortling over how well they're doing. But then the economy turns south, and what do the queries look like? Well, the queries that are negatively correlated with consumer confidence turn out to be business news, uh, not too surprising, and economics. Well, they don't call it the dismal science for nothing. And hybrid and alternative vehicles. So why is hybrid and alternative vehicles in there? Turns out there's a well-known, long-standing relationship that the cheaper the price of gasoline, the better consumers feel. The higher price of gasoline makes them feel bad. And of course, hybrid and alternative vehicles are very sensitive to the price of gasoline as well. So the kinds of predictors you get out of this are fairly uh, plausible. In fact, you feed them into predictive model, and you get a reasonably good uh, prediction for that University of Michigan consumer sentiment 
uh, basically uh, a month or so in advance. So as I said, kids, you can try this at home, download the data, play around with it, go look at those research papers. I think there's a lot of interesting things to, to be found. Thank you.